Good morning and welcome to Sunday worship at North Springfield Church on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. If you're here in the sanctuary, please be sure your cell phone's turned off. If you're watching on the internet and would like to join us in the communion sacrament later in the service, please have a cup of juice and a cracker or a piece of bread close at hand. The flowers at the front are given by Jim and Cheryl Cullison in memory of Walt Powers and by Diane Wetzel in memory of her son Aaron Kadekas's birthday, which would have been tomorrow. Today is the deadline to request a hymn for next week. Pastor Patty's on vacation, so the sermon will be Our Voices Raised in Our Favorite Hymns. Add your suggestion to the forms in the narthex. Copies of the new quarterly devotional, These Days, are also on the counter in the narthex to pick up. Are there any other announcements? Today's loose offering goes toward our monthly community carryout meal. So any loose offering today, community carryout. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to, se that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. These words were written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776. They're part of our nation's most cherished symbol of liberty, the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson used these words to express the convictions and the minds and hearts of the American colonists. July 4th, Independence Day, is a day we all associate with patriotism and what it is that makes a patriot. What makes a patriot is not selfishly reveling in wealth while others go without. It is not brooding endlessly about power, victory, defeat, and revenge, while paying little attention to what is happening with real people in the real world. Our worst qualities did not make our country great. Genuine patriotism is a commitment to the ideals laid out in our country's founding document and the desire for our nation, which is every, uh, every one of its citizens to live up to those ideals by caring for and about each other and by being our best selves. While our country has not yet completely lived up to these ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence for all our citizens, the majority of Americans continue to endeavor to do so. And today we can still be proud that the United States of America continues to be a beacon of hope for those who dream about sharing in the freedom that we enjoy. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, there is no greater feeling of liberation than to experience the freedom from sin and death that you have provided for us through Jesus Christ. Today, our hearts and our souls are free to praise you. For this, we are thankful. At this time of year, when we celebrate our country's Independence Day, we are reminded of all those who have sacrificed for the freedom we enjoy. Let us not take our freedom, both physical and spiritual, for granted. May we always remember that our freedom was purchased with a very high price. Our freedom cost others their lives. Help us to live our lives in a way that glorifies you, Lord. Give us the strength to be a blessing in someone else's life today. And grant us the opportunity to open our hearts and our doors to all those who seek the freedom to live and worship in this country, our country in which we are blessed to live and enjoy our lives. Amen. And now let us stand and continue to honor our country through the singing of My Country Tis of Thee.
hymn number 337. Please join in our call to worship. We have been led to this mountaintop of worship. We come trusting in God's steadfast love. Shout out loud of God's presence with us in this place and in all places, on this day and in all the days to come. Please bow for prayer. O God, you direct our lives by your grace. Your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
we come to the font to remember. The font connects our confession of sin, the grace and cleansing of our baptism, and with our baptismal call every day to new life in Christ. The idol of our times is personal independence. But in truth, we are bossed around by our faults, our poor choices, and the hurts we cause to others. Yet by God's grace, we are set free from all these passions. Therefore, let us join in offering our confessions to the one who welcomes each of us with forgiveness and hope. It seems so simple, God of compassion. To offer a cup of cold water to a thirsty person, just to know we worry about how that might inflate our bill at the end of the month, or to open our own hearts to others, but they may need to be careful for fear they might slip on our icy attitude toward them. Forgive us, we pray. You did not have to become one of us, but you did, so we might know your love. You did not have to welcome us into your family, but you do, so we might experience unexpected grace in our lives. Let us take this time of silence for personal reflection and confession. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Broken, we are made whole. Thirsty, we are filled with living water. Longing for a new renewed relationship with God, we are welcomed with open arms. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Since we are justified by grace through faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn to one another with words and gestures of peace and reconciliation. For those of you at home, peace of Christ be with you. Please bow for our prayer of illumination. Holy One, as we listen in faith and hope, open our souls to your living word. Free us from the confinements of our heart that we may hear the promise of your love for the world. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the first book of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. It presents a miracle of faith God's provision to Abraham that spares the life of Abraham's son, Isaac. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. He, God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took his two young men with him and his son Isaac. 
he cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father! And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And the angel said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Please join with me in a responsive reading of Psalm 13, which is written in your bulletin. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How, How long, long will you shut their pain from my soul and have sorrow in my heart over me? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give life to my eyes, I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice. I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Our epistle reading this morning is Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. This is the first of Paul's letters written about the year 55. In it, the word members means parts of your body, parts which are now dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Hear Paul's words. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. You do not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves to sin, have become obedient to the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. 
I'm speaking in human terms because your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness or sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, as we hear your word proclaimed this day, send your spirit to equip and inspire us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Between my first and second year in seminary, I traveled to Fort Wayne, Indiana to complete CPE, clinical pastoral education, at one of their hospitals. While I was there, I worked as a chaplain in the hospital like the other students, but I had a special opportunity to work as a hospice chaplain as well. Since then, I've read in pastoral care books that often, before their first day visiting patients, CPE students are given a talk, partly a pre uh, pep talk and partly a caution. The essence of this talk is this. When you enter a hospital or a hospice room as a chaplain, you are no longer yourself alone. You are representing Jesus. And alongside you, behind you, following you into the room, invisibly but truly, is the church. You are, of course, yourself, but you stand for very much more than yourself. For the patients and for their families and friends, you bring God with you. As he equips his disciples to be sent forth on their mission in our gospel reading today, Jesus gives them his own version of that same talk. As his representatives, they now carry an identity beyond their own. When they travel, preach, teach, and heal, Jesus' work will be done by their hands. The world will meet him through them. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus advises them. We have it in us to be Christ to each other, to work miracles of love and healing as well as to have them worked upon us. These words by Presbyterian minister and theologian Frederick Beekman could very well have been written as a commentary on our Matthew reading today, which contains 
the heart of gospel, Matthew's gospel, a timeless call for the church to go out into the world as well as to receive and welcome the little ones of the world. In other words, we as Christians are called to both represent Christ to the stranger and to encounter Christ in the stranger. When we think about encountering Jesus in human form, often we think of Matthew 25, in which the Son of Man appears as the least of these. <clears throat> when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. For most of us, Matthew 25 calls us to see Jesus in the other, in those who are hungry and thirsty, lonely and imprisoned, in those who wait in the hospital or hospice beds for student chaplains. Our task as disciples should be active service, inspired by seeing Jesus in the face of others in need. We serve him by serving our neighbors. Mother Teresa reminds us that every day we encounter Christ in distressing disguise, in those hungry, not only for bread, but hungry for love, naked, not only for clothing, but naked of human dignity and respect. Homeless, not only for want of a room of bricks, but homeless because of rejection. In our gospel reading today, Jesus appears not as a person in need, but in a disciple empowered to go forth. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. Jesus speaks in the second person, and he speaks to all of you and me. Christ isn't only visible in the other, in people outside ourselves. It's our privilege and our responsibility to make Christ visible in us. But we can't reflect his face to the stranger if we just stay among the people that we know. Christ is made visible in the act of welcoming and including, in giving and receiving hospitality. If we never encounter the other, Jesus has no opportunity to be revealed in welcome. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their city. This verse marks the end of what is called the missionary discourse of Matthew chapter 10, a chapter packed with action verbs. Jesus summons, gives authority to, sends out, and, and, and he sends out the disciples and, and charges them to go, to cast out, to cure, to proclaim, to raise, to cleanse. These verbs still today define the mission, that is the sending forth of the church, which is the central biblical theme describing the purpose of God's actions in human history. But as Daryl Grutter points out, the Western church's tendency is to see itself and its institutional survival as the purpose of the gospel, rather than its witness. According to Pam uh, Driesel in her commentary in Feasting on the Gospel, she says, inasmuch as the church has been preoccupied with institutional survival, rather than being God's witnesses sent into the world to bless all people, we essentially have not been the church. She goes on to say, the term itself, 
go is simply redundant. There is no such thing as a church that is not, not a missional church. When we cease to be missional, we are no longer the church. As I've said many times before, the church is not just one more community service organization with a mission to serve the community. No, we are much more than that. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, called to be Jesus and to meet Jesus in this world. We are to risk for the sake of love and justice, reputation, persecution, and irreparable family divisions, to face the fierce wolves of harsh individualism, insatiable greed, and exploitive power, to lose our lives and find it, indeed, striving always to show forth the kingdom of God. We are to be Christ to the other, and allow the other to be Christ to us. Our context here at North Springfield Church is much different than Matthew's community. However, the call remains the same. In spite of any and all opposition, we are called to go out into the world to alleviate human suffering and to meet real needs, to work miracles of love and healing by Hospitable acts equivalent to, at least, offering a cup of cold water to one of the little ones. If we keep ourselves faithful to his goal, purpose, and mission, then in Jesus' words, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Indeed, we who need to hear the good news of the gospel spoken to us every single day are called every single day to be brave and courageous and forthright <clears throat> in speaking the good news of the gospel to others, knowing, as was revealed to me in my CPE experiences, that when we do, we are not alone. Knowing that we represent Jesus Christ, knowing that alongside us, beside us, following us into every circumstance and conversation, invisibly but truly, is the church. Knowing that we are, of course, ourselves, but we stand for so very much more than that. Knowing that we bring God with us. Let us pray. Steadfast God, you greet us as a loving parent and patiently love us beyond all measure. Great is your faithfulness. Equip and send us that we may offer that same chesed, that same loving kindness to all whom we encounter, knowing it is Christ whom we greet as we welcome and serve others. Amen.
join together now in our Nicene Creed, uh, which is written in your bulletin. Let us confess the faith of the universal church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of when he was the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We can offer to God only what we have been given. God may require our dearest treasure for it's only lent to us for a little time. What God has provided, we are now invited to invest in the ministry and mission of the church. with me. We are not blessed by God to hoard the blessings for ourselves, but to use them to welcome and include those who are looking for a community, to feed those who hunger for friendship, to serve those who the world has cast aside. Here are our gifts, holy God. We pray you will use them as well as us in the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name.
bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my body. Come and eat at Christ's abundance table, then go forth to feed others as you have been fed here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks to you, creating God, breath of all being. The earth is yours and all that is in it and all who dwell therein. You founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the deep. You planted seeds in fertile ground to rise and sing your praise. Glory to you forever. You formed us from the earth and planted goodness in our souls that we might love like you. You called us to live your law of harmony and to long for your commandments. Yet when our disordered cravings bowed down our spirit, you did not leave us low, but bent down to meet us and grow us up again. Therefore, we lift our voices in thanksgiving, for you have wondrously made us. By water and your life-giving spirit, you have more wondrously remade us to join in the song of all creation that forever praises you. We give you thanks, O God, that you sowed your word in Jesus to grow your kingdom here on earth and draw us ever near. Jesus planted mercy wherever he went to reap a greater righteousness. He shared bread with outcasts and sinners and healed the brokenhearted. As we gather in prayer and worship, as we seek to devote ourselves to following Jesus, we tell of that mystery we call faith. Remembering his dying and rising, we offer you this bread and wine and ourselves in grateful service. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts and upon your people gathered here. Breathe your spirit over all creation, that together we may cultivate peace in every corner of the world. Then bring us to that blessed mountain where, with the meek and pure in heart, we will live forever in blessedness as we taste the fruits of heaven. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. God, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God 
for the people of God. The bread of life given for you. Thanks be to God. The cup of salvation, which is for you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works a continual thank offering to you. Praying that we would bring all for whom we pray your wholeness, healing, and peace, we lift up to you this day the church, the world, and those in any kind of need. <coughs> we pray for the church universal, for the Presbyterian Church USA, and for our own congregation, that your spirit would be poured out on us in surprising and new ways. As we prepare for celebrations on the 4th of July, we celebrate our country, its people and leaders, and all countries, peoples and leaders, especially we pray for the people of Ukraine, Sudan, and all countries in the midst of oppression, violence, or war. We pray for all those injured and the families of those killed in mass shootings around our country. We pray for earth's air, water, animals, and land. Grant us the love and wisdom to be better stewards of your creation. We pray for all those who are homeless or hungry, those who are addicted, those who are grieving, and we pray for all those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. Especially today, we pray for those in the prayer list of North Springfield Church, <clears throat> for Denny, for Terry, Lorna, Rick, Lori, for Karen, Jim Collison's sister, who's in the hospital after a fall at home. For Bob Boyer, Cheryl and Jim's brother-in-law, who is battling bladder cancer. And for all those we now name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, God, help us who have shared this bread and this cup to be Christ's faithful disciples so that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom and our love will be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting all things to your never-failing love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us join together in singing the Lord's Prayer.
go forth now with the gift of the Holy Spirit to walk in God's light as you show others the way to God's heart and to bring hope and healing to the world as you join Jesus in serving those around you and as you gather the little ones into your heart. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day and your whole life long. And the people of God say, Amen.